Hello everyone and welcome again back to Science Fiction Station where I'm going to be reading from this book Bill Noblet Elmer and the Alien Water Thieves by myself Catherine Rose Newey you can follow along if you have the book that's great and also there's some worksheets that go with the book so you need worksheet 3 for chapter 3 Your parents and carers can download those from my website, katherinerosenewy.com. Um, if they sign up for um, all the worksheets and posters, they'll also get the Science Fiction Station worksheets. Okay, so before we start, I'd like to um, just explain the worksheet to you. Right, so we're going to just talk about part A, so the first page of the worksheet before I read. Um, in activity one, it says, in this chapter, Il Noblet receives a visit from a Mutilo Kygography, and it's not a pleasant experience. Listen to the description of the Mutilo Kygographies from the video reading, which I'll do in a minute, jotting down what you hear about them here. And so there's a space on the side for you to put all the descriptions of the Mutilo Kygographies um, on the side, which will help you do a drawing. After I've finished reading, you can then create a wanted poster just below that of the Mutilo Kygographer using all those descriptions so that your drawing is as accurate as possible. Don't forget to offer a cash reward. Okay, and I'll explain the second part of the worksheet when we finish the reading. So let's get to the reading. Now, if some of you might have a slightly older version of the book, in which case your chapter is chapter four, Whereas I'm reading in my book, it's in the newest version, it's chapter three called The Mutilo Kygographies Find Me. Anyhow, I haven't told you about my Irvian family yet. They were sort of chosen for me. It's quite complicated because the Gapetonian scientists have to make me look like the people who live where I will be osmotizing too. So all my genes and cells have to be coded from my and other Earthian parents and then programmed into me when I'm a precellular being, embryo. So I end up looking a little similar to the Earthians around me, not only looking, but also acting the same in some ways. So you might call me a mongrel, mixed breed, like a dog, because I'm part Capitonian, part Earthian. Well, my Irvian mum, who's called Faith Elma, has a florist shop. She called it Faith in Flowers. Actually, we all helped her think the name up. It's quite nice for us because we kids get to go there sometimes after school and help out. The best is working on the till and serving customers, just like we are full cellulars. Luckily, I'm the oldest, so I get more turns, or I have to help the others because they forget. My brother Dylan is seven and my sister Shelley is five. My dad, Peter Elmer, is a detective. My friends at school think that's quite exciting because they imagine my dad spending all his time investigating and catching bad people like they do on telly, which he does do, but he always says most of the time he's in an office or dealing with confused people or drunk teenagers. And the thing is, my dad works at different times every day and often at night too. So we don't get to see him a lot, and that's not so cool. Ill, come on, dinner now! I've called you twice already! My mum's voice breaks into my thoughts, and she sounds annoyed. Oops, these days I've really got into thinking about all the stuff much more, so I spend lots of time in my bedroom on my own. Sometimes Dylan and Shelley come in, wanting me to play, but they don't really ask me so much anymore, because I ignore them. They probably think I'm either daydreaming or doing my homework for school. I run out of my room and look quickly to check no one's looking, then telefer down the stairs. Teleferring is really cool. It's a bit like sliding down the banister, only in air. The wind rushes at my face and I have to bite my lip to stop shouting out in glee. At the bottom of the stairs, I pull my clothes straight, run my fingers through my hair, and more calmly, if a little flushed, into the dining room. Luckily, Irvians are usually preoccupied with their own thoughts and actions, so no one really looks up or speaks to me for a while. As we're sitting down and starting to eat, Shelley starts whining, I don't like this food. 
Nothing unusual. She does this every dinner time. Just eat it, says Dylan, before my mum or dad can say it. I see Shelley starting to screw up her face, which usually means noise will come out soon, so I cover my ears in expectation. Shelley sees my movement and squeals, Stop that, Mum! Eel's pulling faces at me! To cut a long story short, as I've noticed some earthy and larger saying, we all get involved and there's some arguing and somehow I get sent away to my room while Shelley and Dylan are allowed to stay at the dinner table and eat their dinner. It's just not fair being the oldest. I feel cross and upset and I'm sure that's from my earthy side. Gapetonia don't really get angry because they learn as pre-cellulars how to transpackage their anger, which means we deal with it in little bits and don't express it all in one go. I think Irvians, and especially Irvian largers like parents and teachers, should learn to do this more often. Have you noticed how they can suddenly get angry when it appears to us there's no reason? So anyway, I sit at the end of my bed and try concentrating on transpackaging my feelings. I don't like it when I'm treated differently. Mum and Dad always say it's because I'm the oldest, but they don't realise it makes me feel even more alien. It's hard enough trying to fit in and appear normal. Mum knocks on my door and starts to come in, but stops. I know she can see me hunched over on the bed and she probably doesn't know what to say. I think I feel like crying, but I know I have to be careful. As part Gapetonian, if I cry too much, it affects the genetic balance and it could be dangerous for me. Mum talks to me about how we all have to get along in the family and be nice to each other and she says all those nice things human mothers are supposed to say. She gives me a hug and I hug her back. In a small way, it makes me feel a little better. When she's gone, I try transpackaging again, but I feel too weak and tired, and I wonder if I'm becoming too earthian. I eventually fall asleep, dreaming strange dreams about boats flying in the sky. Something wakes me up a bit later. I open my eyes, but it's dark in my room. The house is quiet and I can hear soft snoring coming from Dylan or Shelley's room. Then I hear a slight buzzing noise. Is it inside or outside my window? I strain my ears to hear. And suddenly something falls from above and lands on my bed. I scream, but my scream comes out silently. The thing has landed on my legs and it feels the size and heaviness of a cat. I know we don't have a cat anymore. Poor Muggles was run over by a car a few years back. So unless it's the neighbour's cat? But in the darkness, as I separate the noise of my own heavy breathing from the thing's sounds, I begin to feel scared. The buzzing sounds are very like the sounds made by mutilochigographies, small creatures that telecommute around the universe and steal genetic material from universals to keep themselves alive. The problem is, as they assimilate others' genetic materials, they mutate their own genetic material, and so become all the more difficult to track down and destroy. But what are the mutilochigographers doing on Earth? And how did they get here? And more to the point, why are they here in my house and after me? My brain is racing with all these questions, but then all thoughts are cut off as the creature starts walking up my body and onto my chest. I am really, really, really scared now, and I can hear my own breathing as if it was someone else's, really loud in breaths and out breaths seeming to merge together and sounding like it's coming from somewhere else, not my body. A mutilochigographer is a scary creature to look at. Not only because it looks horrid, but because of its lovely face. It's a small creature with a light purple smooth skin, which is slightly translucent and luminous in the dark. Their skin looks like it is stretched too tightly over their bumbling bodies, but they have beautiful little faces that would seem cute to Earthians. You know how some Earthians like baby animals. However, Mutilochigographers make horrible buzzing noises and walk hunched over, as well as sway side to side precariously because of their odd and gawky body shapes. 
They have large back legs and hips that jut out and then these tiny little claw-like arms and hands which wave slightly as they walk, perhaps to keep their balance. The only nice thing about them really are their baby-like faces, the small neat ears which barely peep out over the top of their heads. I'm quite frozen with fear as the creature buzzes and wheezes and whines and sniffs while it waddles up my body. I know I have to do something, because if they assimilate your tissue, it can change your own genetic makeup, or worse, kill you. There is a Gapiton myth that a few iconics ago, all the Mutilokaigographers travelled to a set of planets in the Typhlooxeret part of the universe and completely wiped out the universals living there. It is now widely believed that the Mutilokaigographers of today are really half Decelus Minders, the universals who used to live on the ten planets Decelus Min and who are now extinct. Suddenly, and thankfully, my Gapitonian training and brain take over. I act on complete instinct and bolt up, throwing the creature up into the air as I land on my feet on the bed. I can feel myself tuning in and all my senses lock onto my target. Everything in the room suddenly becomes bathed in a luminous yellow light. It's my Gapitonian Lumi vision which allows visibility in darker conditions. It's part of my special makeup, and that with a few other things will make me and others from my Swainders Inc. 589642 batch especially attractive for Mutilo Kygographers to assimilate. The creature dashes into the corner of the room, slipping on the floor as it lurches from side to side with its gawky limbs. It slides behind the curtain, trying to hide from my loomy vision, and I launch off the bed, rushing to grab the creature before it telecommutes itself away. I grab at it and manage to lock onto one of its legs or arms. Both had thin and bony bits, so I couldn't tell which was which. I pull hard, trying to hold on the creature so it can't leave. I was hoping to get the whole creature in front of me so I could shrink blast it, which temporarily disempowers them and disables their simulnihilating capacity. This must have made quite a noise because I heard my dad call my name and when I didn't reply he called again and I heard him walking across the landing. The creature was clinging onto the curtain's windowsill and I was having trouble getting a good grip. My dad mustn't see this. I wrenched harder and heard a loud hissing sound which usually means the mutilokaigographer has left one of its limbs behind, an escape tactic of theirs. I pulled the curtain away to see. Its purple arm was in my hand and the creature was in the process of telecommuting away. I concentrated really hard, staring into the middle of its CN cavity and tried to disenable it. I think it worked partly as some green steam started rising from its head, but then it managed to engage its telecommuting ability and was suddenly gone. My dad called my name again. Ill, what's all the noise? What's going on in there? and I heard his steps outside the door. I threw the creature's arm under my bed and raced back to my bed, just managing to pull the covers up as my dad opened the door. It's okay, Dad, just to get at my window, I quickly said, hoping he wouldn't hear my loud breathing. All right then, go back to sleep, son, he said, and pulled the door shut as he left. I breathed a small sigh of relief. Thankfully, I didn't have to explain something unexplainable to him, but at the same time, I knew there would be more alien trouble coming. The Mutilokaigographi had got away without an arm, although that would be easily regenerated, but I'm sure it would be back, and probably not alone. It worried me that at least one Mutilokaigographi had found me. Earth is an especially attractive destination for Gapitonians, as we have usually managed to symbiotically osmotize very well with the Earthians. This planet is in an offshoot of the main byway of the galaxy, tucked away from most of the traffic, so almost all Gapitonians have managed to remain on Earth for the entire Cien telecommuning experience without ever being discovered or visited by any other universals. I say almost all because we've had some dis disappearing mysteriously over the years. Sometimes Gapiton has to de-osmotize us because we're in a dangerous situation and telecommute us back to Gapiton. But sometimes other universals have telecommuted Gapitonians from Earth 
and we've not seen or heard from them ever again. Okay, so how did you get on with writing down all your descriptions of the Mutilo Kaigography on your worksheet? You will now have time to do activity one, which is create the wanted poster for that despicable creature. But I'm uh, just before you do that, I'm going to talk about worksheet part B, which is the second page of the worksheet. Um, and we've got two activities there to do. So activity two, how many syllables does the word mutilo kaigography have? Tip. Use your fingers to count as you say the word aloud. The word mutilo kaigography is almost like a tongue twister in itself. Try reading this aloud very fast. The meddlesome, mercurial, mischief-making, mesmerising mutilo kaigography is mooched mechanically to the monotonous music. Can you say it? Can you say it faster than that? And can you make up a different tongue twister? And there's a couple of websites that you can visit over there um, which have got tongue twisters for you to read and listen to. Activity 3 so when Il Noblet and the Mutilo Kygography battle it loses a limb. Find out about other creatures that can lose parts of their bodies maybe when they're under attack from a predator for example but can grow them back, regenerate. And there's a National Geographic website there for you to go to to find out about um, these types of animals and choose one of them and then write a report about it, including drawing a sketch of the animal. So you'll need to hand write or type your report on a separate piece of paper and make sure that your report has these headings as a minimum. Name of the animal, parts which can be regenerated, other interesting information, anything that you find interesting, and your diagram. Okay, so have fun with that and if you would like to send me any of your work, um, ask your parents and carers to contact me through my website katherinerosenewy.com or reply to any of the subscriber emails if they've signed up for the worksheets. Um, and I'll see you next time when we're going to be reading chapter four and finding out all about Il Noblet when he was still on Gapiton and before he came to Earth. Okay, so look forward to seeing you next time. Over and out. Bye.